He was the lead prosecutor in the Orlando murder trial of Ted Bundy. 45 years ago this Sunday, the world fell apart for a young woman who was living her dream with her college-age roommates and on her own for the first time. He was charming, good-looking, and terrifying. A real-life monster hiding in plain sight. And you're about to meet one of the few women who survived an attack by the world's most notorious serial killer, Ted Bundy. Today, we set out on an emotional journey as we remember the lives lost at the hands of one of the most notorious serial killers in history, Ted Bundy. This video is not intended to glorify the killer, but to honor the memories of his innocent victims. So let's take a moment to remember and pay tribute to those whose lives were tragically cut short. From the early 1970s until his eventual capture in 1978, Bundy murdered and assaulted numerous young women across several states. His charming personality and ability to blend in allowed him to gain his victims' trust before brutally ending their lives. Ted Bundy's reign of terror claimed the lives of at least 30 young women, although the actual number could be much higher. Today, we will focus on just a few of the victims. Linda Ann Healy was 21 years old and a popular student at the University of Washington, majoring in psychology. She often worked with children with disabilities and loved the opportunity to help others. It was a typical day, the day before Linda vanished. She got up at 5.30 a.m. and went to her job at Northwest Ski Reports to make her weather report. After work, she went to class and later that day, Linda had made plans the following day to make dinner for her family at 6 p.m. She borrowed a roommate's car when she got back home and came home around 8.30 p.m. Linda had come into her roommate at approximately 11.30 p.m. to talk before heading to her own room. Linda failed to appear at work the following morning, February 1st, 1974, to give her daily weather report. The alarm went off at 5.30 a.m. as usual, according to Barbara Little. Her roommate went into the room to turn it off and discovered it was empty. Linda had probably already left for work, she thought. The roommates were not worried until Linda's employer called the house to ask why she hadn't come to work. They decided to wait for Linda's father and brother to show up for dinner to discuss her unexplained absence. They told Linda's family that they were concerned that Linda had missed work and no one had seen her on campus that day. Linda's mother immediately called 911 and the Seattle Police Department sent deputies to the home. Donna Manson was born on June 9, 1954 in Olympia, Washington. She was an only child. According to Donna's parents, she can be a little reserved and hesitant to engage in social interactions. Additionally, she had a tendency to experience periods of depression and moderate anxiety. But Donna was a 19-year-old student at Evergreen University in 1974. Donna was last seen on March 12, 1974, at around 7 p.m. by her roommate. That evening, she had mentioned attending a jazz concert on campus. Near the campus library, a different student claimed to have seen Donna, but this claim has not been verified. Donna was last seen with green pants, a long, fuzzy black coat, and a red, orange, and green striped top. At the time, she was also sporting a bull of a caravel watch and a brown agate ring. Since Donna hadn't been reported missing for six days, leads were already dead when detectives started their investigation. All of Donna's belongings were left behind, so it was assumed that she did not leave on her own. Two fishermen were exploring a road near Mount Rainier's foothills on August 29, 1978, when they came across a skull. More human bones were found in the surrounding area, along with human hair and a shirt. The shirt is said to have been multicolored, and contemporary news reports state that it was similar to the one that Donna was last seen wearing. A forensic dentist compared dental records from eight missing persons to the dental records from the found skull. The only possible match was Donna Manson. Ted Bundy kidnapped Susan Elaine Rancourt, age 18, from Central Washington University campus in Ellensburg on April 17, 1974. Her family described her as intelligent, inquisitive, and studious young woman who excelled in school and loved to read. Susan Rancourt washed her clothes in the dorm building's shared laundry room just before 8 o'clock, walked out to Munson Hall for a meeting. After the meeting ended at 10 p.m., Susan left Munson Hall and went back to her dorm's laundry room. It is obvious that Susan never returned to her dorm at Bardo Hall because she did not take her clothes from the laundry room. 
The most likely scenario, according to the detectives, is that Ted saw Susan right after she left the Munson Hall meeting. According to eyewitness accounts, he was wandering around the campus looking for a victim while wearing a fake sling. Bundy must have walked over to Susan after spotting her alone and following her. When he got close enough, he pretended to be having trouble with a load of books he was carrying. Susan did what most people would do and asked the helpless man if he needed any assistance when she saw him struggling. Bundy, of course, took her offer right away. After Susan agreed to assist Bundy with carrying his books, the two left the library's western side and turned right onto Chestnut Street. They then crossed the street and moved northward towards the railway trestle where Bundy had parked his vehicle. Roberta Kathleen Parks, an Oregon State University student, was kidnapped on Monday, May 6, 1974. She was found at Bundy's burial place on Taylor Mountain more than nine months later when a search team came across her skull and jawbone. University student Roberta Kathleen Parks, 20, was from Lafayette, California. Roberta was rarely grouped in with the other missing girls by the media prior to the grisly discovery at Taylor Mountain. Parks had vanished in the interim from a university 250 miles away. Given the distance, many people found the connection between Roberta and the other victims to be uncertain. There were still unanswered questions regarding whether she had fled or not. It was initially hard for King County Detective Robert Keppel to accept that the assailant they knew as Ted would travel so far outside of his hunting territory, according to Keppel. Investigators were therefore somewhat taken aback when they found Roberta's skull among the remains of Brenda Hall, Susan Rancourt, and Linda Healy. Early on June 1, 1974, Bundy kidnapped 22-year-old Brenda Carol Ball from the Flame Tavern in Burien, Washington. Her skull was discovered by accident 10 months later by two forestry students on Taylor Mountain in a remote area. It appears that she was facing a life-changing decision at the time of her murder. Brenda Carol Ball was drinking at the Flame Tavern in Burien on May 31, 1974 in the evening. She became friends with numerous customers and employees as a result. Brenda asked a bandmate she knew if he could drive her home. He replied no though, explaining that he was headed in a different direction. Brenda Carol Ball was captured by Ted Bundy at some point on June 1, 1974 in the early morning hours. The 22-year-old was also no longer burdened by the responsibilities of college because it was now the summer of 1974. She started to party a lot more as a result. Brenda had not only made no contact, but all of her clothes were still in the apartment. Her roommates decided to call her bank and inquire about any recent withdrawals in an effort to allay their worries. Alarms started to go off when they realized there had been no recent activity on her account. Rosemary, her mother, made the decision to report her missing to the police on June 17th as a result. The police didn't see a link between her and the other girls. The police did not think Brenda Carol Ball's case was connected to the other missing girls when she first vanished. Susan Rancourt, Linda Healy, Donna Gail Manson, and Roberta Kathleen Parks were all kidnapped from college campuses. As a result, her case wasn't made public by the authorities until August 7th. As we honor these lost lives, it's critical to remember Ted Bundy's countless other victims, whose stories are equally important. Thank you for joining us on this solemn journey as we remember the lives lost at the hands of Ted Bundy. Please take a moment to like this video, share it with others, and subscribe to our channel to stay informed on more thought-provoking content.